Hello and welcome back to the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. I'm Chuck DeGroat, Professor of Pastoral Care and Counseling at Western Theological Seminary and Senior Fellow at the Newbegin House of Studies. Today we are in conversation with Rebecca Dang, a former refugee who is one of the lost girls of South Sudan. Jenna Branson interviewed Rebecca about her experience as a refugee in the United States and ask for advice on how the church can welcome refugees. Well, today we have Rebecca Dang joining me in conversation uh, a little bit about her life experience as a refugee from South Sudan. Rebecca, thank you so much for having this conversation with me. Uh, Would you mind sharing with us a little bit of your backstory? What were the circumstances that led you to come to the U.S. as a refugee? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jenna. Um, thank you for, you know, welcoming me to be part of this. I, I just want to thank the Holland community, first of all, and the Greater Grand Rapid for welcoming me um, when I came in 2000. Um, so my life story really started when I was five years old, growing up in South Sudan, in what is called now Jongle State. Um, we live in a small village in Duk, and uh, our village was attacked in 1992. And, um, so we have to run. Um, we left the village, we left the life that we know, we left the security that we know, and we have to just walk for a while. And then um, when we came to Bow Town, a UN um, lorries uh, rescue us and bring us um, to a city nearby. And that city was attacked six months later. Mm. So we have to run again, and then we came to Lokichokyo, which is in northern Kenya. From there, the United Nations was involved and they took us in, just like what is going on now with the Syrian Mm -hmm. refugees being in Jordan or neighboring Mm -hmm. countries. So they took us into Kenya and Kakuma refugee camp was my home Mm -hmm. for um, eight years. So Mm -hmm. from 1992 to 2000, Mm -hmm. I was in a refugee camp. Growing up there, things were difficult. There's no formal education. Um, you get a ration card from the UN, um, which you can go to the distribution center and you will get a scoop of corn or bean, um, and that is supposed to last you for 15 days. So you can imagine that d- doesn't last. And then I heard of the Lost Boys of Sudan program, um, that these children are going to be resettled in the United States. And one of the qualifications was that if you are an orphan, you don't have mom and dad, and in that case, I qualify. I lost my mom during one of the running, and my dad was fighting uh, with the northern government, the Khartoum government, during South Sudan liberation. So he got killed in the front line. Wow. So I qualify for, for, for coming to United States. Um, but um, it took about a year and a half for me to even enter to this beautiful, great country. Uh, because the process was long, you know, mm-hmm. take a lot of time. But then fi- finally I came to um, Holland, Michigan, November 6 of 2000. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how I end up in this community. Mm-hmm. I came through Bethany Christian Services mm-hmm. as an accompanied minor, mm-hmm. uh, which means that if you come and you are not 18 and above, you are considered as an accompanied minor mm-hmm. and you have to live with foster family. So Rachel and Lena's baggage, a uh, lovely couple, they were young, they didn't have a child at that time. They took me in as the poster kid. That's how I end up in this community. Mm. And you were, when you came here in 2000, you were how old? I was 15. 15 when you came mm-hmm. to live with Lena and Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Rebecca, would you be able to share a little bit of what your experience was like as a refugee in the U.S.? What were some of the good things, what were some of the challenges that you faced? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I will start with the good thing. So when I arrived for the first time, I woke up and I was not worried about people breaking into Mm -hmm. where I'm sleeping. Um, I get up that very first morning and my dad had made um, made a porridge. Mm -hmm. So that is is something I eat back in a refugee camp. So he made something similar to my Mm -hmm. taste. And that day I had lunch and I had dinner and I knew right away that I'm in a new land of opportunity, not just only to feed my physical body to be healthy, 
but um, there were just dreams ahead. Mm. So that was really good. Um, when I went to Harlem Christian as part of breaking into uh, really formal school for the first time in my life, um, I was now 15, so I'm supposed to go to high school, but I had uh, English of a third grade or even second, mm -hmm. to be honest. So a lot of my teachers rallied behind me. Uh, I find friends from high school, really good two friends that have changed my life. Mm -hmm. Um, they were there for me, they didn't judge me. Um, I didn't know how to communicate with them, but they just sat with me um, and welcomed me in. And my teachers did the same thing. Um, I, I'm pretty sure I was the first uh, ESL student. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what to do with me, uh, but they were patient. And my, my uh, foster parent, Leisha and Lannis, were just like kind, you know, they try all they can to love me, to tell me that I'm here. So I would say that the generosity of uh, Holland, Michigan, people that I cross ways at churches, at school, um, just even at the grocery store mm -hmm. and just like, hi to me, that was really welcoming. Mm -hmm. I felt welcome. I felt really welcome. On top of that, of course, you know, refugee camp was difficult, but it was my home. It was uh, my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I know everybody. I can predict everything, but coming here was hard. Um, so that part was challenging, trying to feed in, trying to uh, learn English at the same time and try to communicate, to convey mm -hmm. how I'm feeling. So most of the time I did really share how I'm feeling. And coming in November where it's dark and snow and this is a 15 years old girl that grew up looking at the sun every single day. And then I came to a place that is so dark, it's snowy, and people are indoor, people are not saying hi to each other very much. That was really difficult for me when I look back those times where I was just indoor for at least four months, five months, mm -hmm. and that I couldn't communicate how I was feeling. Um, those were really difficult. And then sometime every now and then I did run into situations that are kind of awkward and not not very kind of awkward and racist, not friendly, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So those were hard time for me, mm -hmm. um, where you just run into somebody. For example, one time I was at Meyer, and, and my husband was there, and um, we were online, and somebody was checking out, and then she just told me, "Hey, back off! Like, why are you?" standing so close to me, do you want to steal my information? And I was like, mm. what? I wasn't even looking. I was like, what, what are you talking about? So things like that, you know, so there's a couple of those that I have mm. run into that make it not friendly, but I mm. still have to remind myself like, you know what? Maybe that person had a bad day <laughs> and there are plenty of people that love me. Yeah. It's very gracious of you. What advice or experience would you like to share with the church about uh, refugees in light of the political rhetoric that's surrounding refugees and immigrants right now in the U.S.? And maybe what are some practical ways that the church can get involved with the issue? Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking yeah. that. I know it's a really difficult time for our country. Um, it hasn't been really good, you know, with economic crash and all the problem in the war and all the terrorists. So it's a difficult time for our country. And uh, one thing that I will just give as advice is that uh, these refugees, um, when they come to a new country, they absolutely have no other choice mm. but to flee where they are because it's dangerous, uh, because there's no future, there's no promising. Um, Things can be tough in people's own country, but like nobody can leave their families and everything that they know unless they really have to. So these people really have to come mm -hmm. to the United States. Number two, it takes about like a year or more for people to go through the process. It's really intense. Um, you know, you have to be interviewed many times. Uh, you have to do physical checkup and you know, and, and I know now they even have like a scanning of people's face mm. so and eyes mm. so that they can know that you are the person you say you are mm. and a lot of background check. The Homeland Security is really involved in the process. 
So I want people to know that don't understand this process of refugees, that it's a well thought out process. Mm. Our government put tons of money in it mm. and they partner with the UN, United Nations mm -hmm. for Refugees to do interview and uh, IOM, International Immigration Office, um, to do, um, you know, check for diseases and all of that. It's a long mm. process. So, um, I just because it's like it's hard when people hear like oh these people just come to the country and nobody know who they are people mm -hmm. know who they mm -hmm. are there's piles of information on them so that's one thing that um, it takes a long time for them to come and it's process and then um, when they come to this country they are really here to make life mm -hmm. now other people maybe that uh, might have been bad or something like that. You know, people are people and there might be a mistake where one person come into this country that they're not supposed to come. But these people really, from what I know, from all the lost boys that came and the 79 girls mm -hmm. that came with the boys as part of the lost boys, because you hear of the lost boys of Sudan, but you right. don't hear about the right. girls, but there were 79 girls yeah. that came. I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. So when we came here, we just want opportunity and we didn't want to harm anybody, you know. Yeah. So we just want to be loved, we want to form friendship, we want to be part of the community. But there are some, you know, like when somebody goes th through traumatic event, there are some of them that get deported back. Maybe they become violent and all of that. But it's not because they want to hurt people, it's because they have been hurt and the only way to deal with life is you know, making decisions that are not mm. not healthy for them and not healthy for others people. Yeah. For example, being violent or like, mm. you know. So there are those issues. So my advice to the church is to be open and love mm. those people. Um, to be open and love refugees. If you know anybody in your community, uh, find time, be their friend, go for a walk with them, have a tea with them. Mm. Um, you know, if they are in your Bible study, just ask them slowly or invite them, you know. Part of the, the, the very practical thing that I will encourage my community is that when I came, it was so um, welcoming when somebody can just ask me, hey, do you want to meet up for lunch? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to go for coffee? Or can I come over? Um, from the culture I come from, it was really good. Uh, I know in this culture, in a Western culture, it's more like, oh, I don't want to cross into person, personal mm -hmm. space. Um, but it seems, you know, <laughs> when, when you are welcome and people don't visit you for a long time, it's a sign, it seems like, oh, you are not welcome. Mm -hmm. But when they are there, from the culture I come from, if I'm mm -hmm. tired and don't really want you, I'll be frank with you. I'll be like, Jana, you know what? I don't really want to see you today. I'm busy and I have this. And I mean it, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you come and I'm happy, I'm like, yeah, let's have tea and all this. I mean it too at the same time. So the practical way that we can be involved as church is finding one individual person, you know, mm -hmm. and be practical, be a relationship with them. Another way, which is a bigger way, is like, you know, we are reaching now to the election season. Mm. It's really praying mm. and thinking hard about issues that are at the heart of Christ and making decision mm. on your boat. Your boat is your voice, yeah. you know. So practice that to boat in a way that you think that deep down you think that matter mm. to you and think that you think that our Lord will support. Mm. Um, Jesus talked a lot about welcoming our strangers mm -hmm. and loving those that are not like us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very core of the gospel. So if you are a believer and you think that's what is in your heart, then you have to think hard. And how do you make that up? And boarding is one of them. Making practical friendship with a person is one of them. Volunteering at a refugee center mm -hmm. is another way of them. Being part of Bethany Christian Services, the great organization that bring people of different faith and different background is another way to be practical. Rebecca, thank you so much for being with us today, answering some questions, telling a little bit about your experience. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to volunteer with refugees in your community, contact your local church or a local refugee resettlement organization like Bethany Christian Services.